Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry. I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Acts video. I thought it was very timely right now with the current tensions between the United States and Iran to cover a video that might explain context because understanding historical context is necessary to make sense of world events currently. So today what I wanted to check out is what Crash Course World History did on it. All right, the original video is down below. Be a good idea to check that out first and then you can come and see what I have to add. All right, let's get started. All right, if you were a high school student or somebody studying maybe even for a college test, you might have seen this video already because you're probably watching a lot of Crash Course. So it might be interesting to go back to it if you've, you know, you've seen this and kind of look back on, you know, Crash Course videos because they have been so popular for so many years in, you know, in education. So, all right. But if you're one of those classes, you know, you had a world history class like in high school, there's probably a good chance you never even got to the Iranian revolution or even talked about it. So one of the last, in the last few weeks um, in my class, I always try to make sure to get to, you know, as close to the modern era as possible. But this is something that has been painfully understudied in general world history classes. And there's a good chance you might be confused about a lot of things going on. And this event, and we'll see how they cover it, um, is a crucial one to understand current geopolitics. So all right, let's see what uh, the Crash Course crew had. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course World History, and today we're talking about Iran. Oh, Mr. Green, Mr. Green, I know that country. It's in the Middle East. It's with Egypt. Nope. nope. Me from the past. We're all. going to talk about Iran. Now, I, I used to be... This is actually something that upsets a lot of Iranians, is they, like, don't they speak Arabic, and they're right in the middle of the Middle East and stuff? Iran has a very different history than Arabian history. Very different. They don't like to be... Um, grouped in with that speak different language um and often practice a different version of islam not people know that because um iran is uh also heavily shia muslim and if you don't understand that difference that's really important for you to you so i remember when you would look at this part of the world and you would be like oh yeah that's a thing and in your case that that thing extended more or less from i guess like western china to like uh poland then you'd make a bunch of broad <laughs> generalizations about that okay. area and no doubt you the terms Arab and Muslim interchangeably. But as usual, me from the past, the truth resists simplicity. So today we are going to talk about Iran and just Iran, specifically the 1979 Iranian Revolution. By the way, it's very common um, if you have met somebody from Iran to actually not hear them call themselves Iranian. Uh, it's very possible that they may call themselves Persian. Um, and a lot of that has to do with kind of the different sides you might have been on on the Iranian Revolution. But going back to that history of being Persian, and that concept of Iran being actually a more uh, a newer one. So yeah, very common. You might hear that. I've I've met, you know, people that would have been from Iran that consider themselves uh, Persian, which also sounds cool because it's like Persian Empire of the old days, you know. So the 1979 Iranian Revolution and its aftermath are often seen by detractors as the first step in the creation of an isolated fundamentalist state that supports terrorism. And you might be surprised that to hear would be me true, say though. that there is some truth to that interpretation. It's deeper than that. That said, the way you think about the Iranian Revolution depends a lot on which part of it you're looking at. And regardless, it's very important because it represents a different kind of revolution from the ones that we usually talk about. So the 1979 uprisings were okay. aimed at getting rid of the political Pahlavi dynasty, which sounds like impressive, but this dynasty had only had deep two are they kings, go back? Reza Shah and Muhammad Reza Shah. Before the I, Pahlavis, I really want to know. I want to really want to make. I really hope that they go into how those people came into power in the first. Iran was ruled by the Qajar dynasty, and before that, the Safavids. The Safavids and Safavid, Qajars yeah. were responsible for two of the most important aspects of Iran. The Safavids made Shia Islam the official state religion, right. starting with Ismail the First in 1501, and the Qajars gave the Muslim clergy the ulama political power so most um by the way so the adent at uh, um, um adherence to shia islam that was established by the safavid empire ishmael very young uh, emperor king um did that and putting themselves and really isolating themselves and creating like a, a shia islamic dynasty put the um that dynasty the safavid dynasty really at odds with much of the Islamic world because most of the world back then and today was Sunni. I think today it's about 85 to 90% are Sunni. And that put them at odds with multiple groups. Um, you had the Mughal dynasty in the East that ruled India and they were um, they were Sunni. But then uh, the like Ottoman Empire who was, uh, who was also Sunni on the West and the Safavids and Ottomans fought each other for decades and even centuries 
um, because, well, a lot of it was land disputes, but also you had the religious differences. Also, the Safavids were very, uh, again, exclusively Shia. And one thing the Ottomans didn't like is that they believed that Sunnis inside of the Safavid Empire were uh, persecuted. And it's true that they weren't given a lot of positions in government historically and stuff like that. But yeah, the, so that there was a religious conflict between them. And, has, and, and again, it's still to this day is divided, I guess, today, what you'd call Iranians or people of that territory with a lot of the Islamic world. Most of the world's Muslims are Sunnis, but the Shia, or Shiites, are an important sect that began very early on, around 680 CE, and today form the majority of Muslims in Iran and Iraq. Now, If you didn't know, the first split of that Sunnis and Shiites came with the disagreement for who was the successor to Muhammad. Should it be a family member or somebody from the... Um, uh, chosen from the community and Shiites kind of went down that path of it should kind of be from a family lineage line now there's other things that separate Sunnis and Shia but that was one of the first splits uh, that happened okay think of it like how in Christianity you have Protestants and Catholics and they might disagree upon leadership and leadership of the past of you know Christianity so uh, think of it that way if you don't have any context for how there's diversity within Islam just like there's in Christianity with like Again, Catholics, Protestants. Within both Sunni and Shia, there are further divisions and many sects, but we're just going to yeah. talk about like the historical difference between the two. Shia Muslims believe that Ali okay. should have been the first caliph. Sunni Muslims this think isn't that Abu be Bakr as relevant was the to first caliph, was rightly chosen. Since that disagreement, there have United been many States others, many doctrinal differences. Policy. But what's most important is that from the very beginning, Shia Muslims saw themselves as the party of the oppressed, standing up against the wealthy and powerful, and hearkening back to the social justice standard that was set by the prophet and this and that's going to create more of their division amongst the rest of the islamic world than like western nations i don't think western nations and non-islamic western nations don't really play in i think the sunni shia difference at all and in fact has been painfully underappreciated which has led a lot of western states to not understand a lot of the conflicts that go on historical ones like this but even ones of love terror and stuff like that like terrorist activities which again largely are seen as sunni versus shia and just looking at that under like one big umbrella is really can provide a false narrative this connection between religious faith and social justice was Ayatollah. extremely important to the Iranian revolution in 1979 and also to previous revolutions in Iran. This is really crucial to understand because many historians argue that the Iranian revolution represents what the journalist Christian Carroll called an odd fusion of Islam and late 20th century revolutionary politics. But actually, in the okay. scheme of Iranian history, it's not so odd. Because 1979 was not Iran's first revolution. The first right. major one was in 1906. It forced the ruling codgers to accept a constitution it created okay so you, you gotta understand historical context in 1906 1900s this is the age of imperialism this is the age of european imperialism where most of the world was being either colonized or had puppet states and something like that and iran was was no different than that especially when it came to oil and that kind of stuff but um iran being you know again i'm using this term iran because it's what it's called today but it wasn't called that back then uh, was also an integral part of that, especially like amongst like the British Empire. There a parliament and supposedly some limits on the king and made Shia Islam the official state religion, but it also protected the rights of minorities in Iran. It ultimately failed partly because the clergy withdrew their support, partly because the Shah worked very actively against it, and maybe most importantly because the Russians and the British worked to keep Persia weak so they could continue to try to dominate the region. Which Same thing happened in Afghanistan. They called it the Great Game. Russia and Britain competing over Afghanistan. Afghanistan. And one thing you know about Afghanistan history is that it never works. <laughs> Reminds me that most people in Iran are not Arabs. They are Persian. Yeah, most people in Iran don't speak Arabic. They speak Farsi, Farsi, or as we often call it in English, Persian. So after World War One, that's probably that's, that's really just like one of the most frustrating things for again Iranians is they're 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 very different. They have a different eth ethnicity. Some of that goes back to like Indo-Aryan stuff, you know, um, from thousands of years ago, and very different from the Arab origins. Like they're very different, Iranian origins and like Arab origins, which you're gonna see in um, Iraq and you know Palestine and, and Saudi Arabia, Egypt. Heated up because of the discovery of oil in the oil Middle East. The British the established thing. the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, which would later come to be known as BP. BP they also extracted a bunch of concessions from the Iranian government in addition to extracting lots of oil. And they helped to engineer a change in dynasty by supporting the military commander Reza Khan in his coup in February 1921. <laughs> Reza Khan became Reza Shah and then he attempted 
to turn Persia, which he renamed Iran in 1935, into a modern, secular, Western-style right. state, right. kind of like Turkey was under Ataturk. But well, and that's also something that the Western nations would have wanted. So, you know, it's to have those resources to be able to go in and to be able to, you know, uh, um, extract oil and do all that stuff took a lot of foreign um, investment and you have someone like the british who came in now what you can expect was you know the british are going to come in and this is just imperialism 101 americans british anybody right is that you want to it is to your interest to have a regime in power in the place you have economic interest you want to have a regime there that is going to be uh supportive of your economic ambitions right so it was seen you know like in this case specifically by the british that it was mandatory to have somebody there regardless potentially though understand this it's not a priority that that regime is even supported by the common people because they don't really care about that they want a regime in there that's going to benefit their interests and this can be problematic because what if you prop up a regime that is unpopular that by extension is going to make you unpopular Reza Shah is perhaps best remembered for his over-the-top dictatorial repression, which turned the clergy against him. Okay, so during World War II, Reza Shah abdicated, and his young son Mohammad Reza Shah became the leader of Iran, which he remained mostly until 1979, when he he definitely stopped being the leader yeah. of Iran. So you did uh, also see in there that they that these 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 regimes were also more secular. Now, for a lot of people, maybe that's not going to be a big deal. And it wouldn't be, you know, for, for a lot of them. But what was the big deal was amongst like very religious conservatives that felt that because there was this this happened in the Ottoman Empire, too, where like people also equated like the progressivism, I guess you would say, or secularism is really a better word for this as a sign of westernization and thereby undermining the culture the religious and and, and 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 traditions and culture of a region, uh, say again, like this, like this with this one or with with Iran. So, like Islamic conservatives felt that this would undermine their culture, and that Westernization is also going to undermine that. So, it's going to offend, you know, those people more on the extreme side, you know, on the religious argument. Um, and sometimes those voices can be very loud and can be very disruptive. Okay, in Ottoman Empire, it was at times. Sometimes they're not. After World War II, the British allowed greater popular participation in Iran's government. The main party to benefit from this openness was Tuday, the Iranian Communist Party. Mohammad Mossadegh was elected prime minister in 1951 Mossadegh. and led the parliament to nationalize Iran's oil industry, and that was the end of the democratic experiment. Now, most history books say that in 1953, the British and the CIA engineered a coup to remove Mossadegh from office. Okay, it's important to understand, because they didn't really bring up the perspective. Why? communism or whatever <laughs> you know um and even though it, for him it wasn't going to be nearly as much from what i understand I, I need some help on this a little bit with mossadegh policy but um communism if we're defining it by its definition of a stateless classless moneyless society is not necessarily what they're advocating for why so many countries definitely turn to like socialist um tendencies was as a way to defeat imperialism because that oil production, right, that that's that's coming um, uh, out of Iran at this time is not benefiting the Iranian population. It is benefiting the British and the business owners of B what's today BP oil. That was not going back to the people. So like the people feel like they are being exploited because their greatest economic asset, oil, is not even in their control. So like what, what someone like Mossadegh was coming in was saying is – the state, okay, like Iran, uh, it's, you know, again, whatever with names, but like Iran, the people, the people need to control those um, benefits. It's, it's, it's controlling the means of production, I guess, in that way, which puts you in the, 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 the communist umbrella. But for them, it was like, we need to control our own resources. Um, Egypt did the same thing. Okay. You had that, that oil production, the um, it's why also they're going to uh, stage a takeover of the, um, of uh, the Suez Canal, which was one of their greatest economic things, which that also was funded by um, and controlled largely by foreign entities. So like what you saw with these regimes that came in, OK, like Nasser or Mossadegh um, um, over here was trying to gain control of their resources because it was being exploited by foreign powers. That was their mindset 
of why they're adopting these policies. And as you know, in the West, they're not going to like that, right? Anything under the socialist or communist umbrella is going to be very bad for their own ideologies, but also very important for their economic interests. And that is quite possibly true. It is definitely true that we tried to engineer a coup. It's also true that Mossadegh quit and fled Iran following demonstrations against him. But we also know that the Shia clergy encouraged those demonstrations. That's true. a bit of a weird decision it was complicated. for the clergy, considering that Shia Islam traditionally takes a radical stance against oppression. But it's important to remember that Mossadegh was supported by the two-day party and they were communists. Nationalization of the oil industry was one thing, but a further shift toward communism might mean appropriation of the land that supported the clergy, maybe even a rejection of religion altogether. So now we've seen two So that can provide some alliances. So you're going to have these coups. The CIA and stuff is part of the British were part of it. They were trying to delegitimize Mossadegh and um, and undermine his support and try to like divide and conquer a lot of the parties there. But yeah, like I said, it definitely didn't help that even like the religious conservatives did not support um, someone like Mossadegh, at least not not some of them. And um, because he wasn't necessarily advocating for like, you know, religious clerics to, you know, run the country like a lot of, you know, con uh, religious conservatives would have. Right. So it's like he wasn't going far enough. You know what I mean? So that became a little bit easier for like British or American intelligence to undermine Mossadegh that way, divide and conquer with, with that. And this is, again, something very similar you saw around the world with, you know, leaders like these try to undermine their support. Asians where the Shia clergy's support rejection of religion Talking a lot. Sorry altogether. So now we've seen two occasions where the Shia clergy's support helped facilitate change, right? In 1906 and again in 1953. So let's flash ahead to 1979. The Shah was definitely an autocrat, and he employed a ruthless secret Very police called the Savak to stifle dissent. In 1975, the Shah abolished Iran's two political parties and replaced them with one party, the Resurgence Party. You'll never guess who was resurging, the Shah. There was a huge round of censorship and arrests and torture of political prisoners, signaling that autocracy was in Iran to stay. But remember, this is, and just again, remember, this is a, this is a regime that's supported by the West. So you can see how there's going to be animosity attached to that you know, for like Americans or the British or the West in general, because they're supporting this guy who's very unpopular. Before those events in 1975, say between 1962 and 1975, by most economic and social measures, Iran saw huge improvements. In oh, 1963, yeah. the Shah had tried to institute what he called a white revolution, top-down modernization led by the monarchy, and in many ways he was successful, especially in improving industry and education. Oil yeah, Tehran, someone like Tehran, the capital, is, would almost be unrecognizable to what it was today. Okay. You had, it looked very Western. You can look at pictures of women, you know, with like, you know, like the shorter dresses, you know, that they had in the West and women going to like universities and some of these like progressive secular type of things were, were coming along with that. But it's still though meant that you may have these things that some people might benefit from, but this was still a very unpopular, oppressive regime. But yeah, very interesting the the, the shift that's going to happen in urban centers before and after the or the uh, Iranian Revolution. Well, revenues rose from five hundred fifty-five million dollars in nineteen sixty-four to twenty billion in nineteen seventy-six, and the Shah's government invested a lot of that money in infrastructure and education. The population grew, mm -hmm. infant mortality fell, a new professional middle class arose. But the White Revolution wasn't universally popular. For instance, it was opposed by one particular Shia cleric, the Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. Khomeini spoke out against the White Revolution from the secular. religious center of Iran. Western. One of his main complaints was that the reforms would grant more rights to women, including the right to vote, but he also attacked the government for, quote, the rigging of elections and other constitutional abuses, neglect of the poor, and the sale of oil to Israel. And, in and that was all happening, too. So you see how it's like no regime here is supported by everybody, right? other constitutional abuses, neglect of the poor, and the sale of oil to Israel. Now, the, the, the whole Iran support of Israel is also going to be a very complicated thing because you might be like, why are uh, you know being against against Israel? I mean, not support of Israel, sorry, against Israel because they're very much against it, uh, current regime. Um, especially this this regime that's 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 in this uh, more um, Islamic con conservative, uh, uh, religiously conservative regime that's coming, that's going to be coming in here, right? 
It would have been a lot less for previous regimes. And in general, Khomeini felt that a king's power was inherently un-Islamic and that Shia tradition was to fight that power. That noted about Khomeini, the 1979 revolution didn't start out to create an Islamic state. At first, it was a pretty typical to uprising down the by dissatisfied Iranians to overthrow a government that they perceived as corrupt and unresponsive to their needs. Does that remind you at all of Russian Revolution? You know how Russian Revolution was also basically in two parts? How you had the first version, which was like take down the you know monarchy, which so many people could then agree upon. But then you have like a power vacuum. Okay, what should the next regime be? You know, and in Russia, it's going to be the Bolsheviks, the communists, and here it's going to be um, Islamic fundamentalists. Might have, or arguably because of oil-fueled economic growth, many Iranians weren't enjoying economic success. The universities were turning out more graduates than Who's there were talking jobs, about? and the mechanization of agriculture had the predictable result of displacing farmers who moved to cities, especially the capital city of Tehran, where there weren't nearly enough jobs for the number of people. So I think it's unfair to say that a majority of the demonstrators who took to the streets in late 1978 were motivated by a fundamentalist vision of Islam. They were dissatisfied with economic inequality and political repression and a corrupt regime. So why do we generally remember the 1979 revolution as having been motivated by Shia Islam? Well, let's go to the thought bubble. Okay. So the initial demonstrations did begin after an Iranian newspaper on January 7th, 1978, published an article that was so, critical of Khomeini. But he didn't really talk about Khomeini as much so far. Khomeini is the leader of this more Islamic inspired party that's coming in that wants to be an answer to what they believe is the problems that are still created by you know, whatever is not you know hand, uh, helping the poor or whatever, but also fight imperialism to try to do both of those things, right? And fight imperialism, but then also you know uh, uh, have more influence over like the social structure. By the way, at the time he was living in Paris, these initial published an article that was critical of Khomeini. By the way, at the time he was living in Paris, these initial demonstrations were pretty small, but when the government police and army forces started firing on demonstrators, killing some of them, the protests grew. Each time marchers protested against the violent treatment of demonstrators, the government would crack down and their violent reaction would spur more demonstrations. There was also a lot of criticism of the West tied up in the revolution. According to one woman who participated, American life lifestyles had come to be imposed as an ideal, the ultimate goal. Americanism was the model. American popular culture, books, magazines, film had swept over our country like a flood. We found ourselves wondering, is there any room for our own culture? The so, you can, so do you see what's what's happening now there? It's like, it, it's like this, it became this like belief that was being pushed. I guess you would say they're saying being pushed on Iranians that it's like to accept all of these modern new political ideas progressive things whatever it is more voting more access to education and economic opportunities it's like you had to accept everything western even the cultural stuff like there was no separation between like the political and economic changes and cultural changes and that's where a lot of these people are like no like it doesn't need the, some of these people are like no it doesn't need to be that way you don't have to accept all this western culture but like accept some of these other things that Westerners have um, that a lot of people would be, you know, supportive of. Like I said, we said some of the maybe the political and and uh, economic changes. Like a flood, we found ourselves wondering: Is there any room for our own culture? The Shah never understood why so many people were protesting against him. He thought that they were communists or being supported by the <laughs> British. He also thought that merely bringing prosperity would be enough to keep him in power. Mm. It wasn't. On January 16, 1979, he left Iran. He eventually ended up yeah. in the U.S., which had unfortunate consequences for diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Iran, but the point- Yeah, because the U.S. basically harbored him after he was pretty much threatened with his life to have to get out. So you can see how the new regime in Iran is not going to like the Americans because they're like, you're harboring the guy that we just ousted, therefore making you on that same level of that guy. Here's that the know. first part of the Iranian revolution was relatively peaceful protest followed by a government crackdown, more protests that eventually led to the collapse of the monarchy. And that looks kind of familiar, especially if you've studied like the French or Russian or even the American revolutions. <laughs> and most historians argue these protests weren't about Islam, but rather the discontent over living conditions, pay cuts, and the threat of unemployment fused with the general disillusionment and anger with the regime. The and this is what you would, you might have heard a lot of people that supported this revolution would say. 
Okay. The government that eventually replaced the monarchy was the second and in many ways much more revolutionary revolution. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So the new Islamic Republic of Iran was based on Khomeini's idea about what an Islamic government should be, a principle he called veliat e -faki. Mainly, it was that a Sharia law scholar would have ultimate authority because he was more knowledgeable than anyone about law and justice. Um, you know that if you don't know what Sharia law means. So Sharia law, is, it's Islamic law essentially. So um, the Quran is full of a lot of law. Um, the Quran is not just about, you know, like say the Bible or other religious texts where it's about relationship with just like, like God, how do you get to heaven and all that stuff. A lot of things in like the Quran are about like governance, right? So um, uh, how to deal with like business and how to deal with politics and justice and all these things. So it's it's tied. There's no separation really with Sharia. If you want to look at it from like secular and religious law, it's all it's all into one because they believe the Quran is, you know, perfect word of God, and that if it's in there, it should be you know adhered to, right? So it's not just setting it aside. So that's what they believe that you should have that. So it's going to be very religiously influenced. There would be a legislature and a president and a prime minister, but any of their decisions could be overturned Not by really the Supreme separation ruler, who from 1979 until his death was Khomeini. Now, house. if democracy is only about holding elections, then the new Iran was a democracy. I mean, Iran has elections, both for right. president and for the parliament. And for the Iranian record, Republic. despite what Khomeini might have thought in the 60s, women can vote in Iran, and they do. They also serve in the parliament and in the president's cabinet. And in the referendum... And this is why, why, why they're saying that, like, you know, they were saying earlier that this this regime is saying we can still have those things right that were shared by the west of like women to vote and all that stuff but we don't have to just go all into american culture that's what they were saying and why this revolution wouldn't just be by some small group of you know very religious fundamentalists but have a broader reach on whether to create an Islamic Republic of Iran, the vast majority of Iranians in a free and open vote voted yes. Now, governance in Iran is extremely complicated, too complicated for one crash course video. But in one sense, at least, Iran is definitely not a democracy. The ultimate authority written into the Constitution is not the will of the people, but God, God who is represented the by the supreme religious leader. And the actions of the Islamic Republic... Especially That's where, if you were a secularist, this isn't for you. If you were wanted to have a pure secular culture, this may not be for you. And by the way, a lot of people that left Iran, like I was saying, a lot of people that might consider themselves like Persian, not Iranian, that's where some of them might have that difference. Cause usually a lot of them, um, or at least in my experience, I could be wrong on this, but those like people that have left, maybe they went to the United States or something like that, saw themselves, you know, uh, as uh, promoting more of, of a secular culture, even if they are Muslim, doesn't mean you're not Muslim, but more of a secular culture. And a lot of them would have left because they uh, didn't like this regime and kind of the changes that were infusing religion and politics and everything so much, you know. The chaotic days of 1979, but also many times since, don't conform to most ideas of effective democracy. Like one of the first things that Khomeini did to shore up his not a lot of, was to create the Islamic not Revolutionary a Guards in Hezbollah to defend the revolution against coup attempts. Although initially there were opposition parties, their activities were curtailed by the new revolutionary courts that applied Sharia law in a particularly Religious harsh courts. fashion. Like it's estimated that by October 1979, several hundred people had been Executed. And under the new constitution, Khomeini was given extensive power. I mean, he could appoint the heads of the armed services and the Revolutionary Guard and the national TV and radio stations. He also approved the candidates for presidential elections. Let me go back to that again. Khomeini was given extensive power. I mean, he could appoint the heads of the armed services and the Revolutionary Guard and the national TV and radio stations. He also so <laughs> controlling the media and stuff like that, they're going to be doing that um, as well. Appointing people, there's going to be some things that are, again, are less democratic. Also approved the candidates for presidential elections and appointed six of the 12 members of the Guardian Council that approved legislation from the parliament before it became law. So structurally, Iran's government looked kind of like other governments, but as Michael Axworthy points out, it was different because, quote, above and beyond stood the Faki with the power and the responsibility to intervene directly in the name of Islam 
realm, indeed with powers greater than those given to most monarchs in constitutional monarchies. By 1979, Iran already had a long history of clerical involvement in protest and dynamic change, but it also had a long history of pushing for constitutions and liberty. The current end result is the Islamic Republic of Iran, but it's worth remembering that both those threads of history are still part of Iranian life. Like we saw that in 2009 and 2010 with the so-called Green Revolution, where there were huge protests after an Iranian election. Those protests involved young people arguing for more rights and liberties, but they were also led by and encouraged by reformist Shia clerics. In the U.S., we mostly remember the 1979 It's Iran. like, it's like Iran has consistently dealt with this of like, and, and disagreed, you know, amongst their people of where are they drawing the line between secular forms, reforms, and like still religious institution? Like, where is that line going back and forth and why you do have multiple revolutions happening here? Because they've seen, I guess a lot of these people think they've seen the worst of both sides. They saw it when you had the Shah completely propped up by uh, like imperial nations and, and how that devastated, you know, local people that way. But then you saw like a swing the other way so far where it's like the culture is, you know, Islamic culture or whatever and Shia culture is like so invested into every instance that some people are like, okay, it's gone too far. So it's like, where does the pendulum swing? In revolution for its burning like it's of still American being figured flags out, isn't and it? taking of hostages in the American embassy. That belonged more to the second phase of the revolution, the chaotic period when the Islamic Republic was being born. Life in the Islamic Republic of Iran remains that? highly repressive. Hostage I mean, for crisis. instance, Iran still executes a very high percentage of criminals. But it's yeah. inaccurate to say that Iran is merely a dictatorship or that it's merely repressive. And one of the challenges for people in the West trying to understand Iran is that we have to disentangle the various aspects of the revolution rather than simply relying on the images that have defined it for us. I hope this episode can help a little. Historical you can find context, more resources I guess, in the links below. My definition Thanks for there. watching. Crap. All right. Okay. Final thoughts. Okay. So I guess I got two different questions. It depends on what your experience and your knowledge of Iranian history is. If you are brand new to this, you've never heard about Iranian history, especially not Iranian revolutions. You know, after learning what John, you know, it was presenting here, what do you think right now? And what light maybe has this shed upon current politics and geopolitics? Has it shed some light to understand where this hostility has come from? We're able to make the connections between the West, especially like the United States in the current conflict um, with that as well. Now, I implore you, of course, though, if you are new to this, your learning about Iranian history should not stop with this crash course video. You got to go way deeper and look at other perspectives, right? Um, if you are somebody that has invested a lot of this and have been have, have been coming from it maybe for years or whatever um, with hopefully the intention of trying to detangle some of the biases or at least be aware of some of the biases. What do you think about this video in covering those aspects? Do you think it did a good job? Do you think there is other context, you know, necessary context that's missing? And if it is, if it is, what it, what else needs to be added to the situation? Now, what was not covered and at all in this and is any with uh, history with like Iran and say Israel, which is going to looks like need some other coverage with that. So anyway, doesn't answer all of the modern context, but maybe it can get you a start and get you more interested in learning from other perspectives. So make sure you're doing that. Make sure you're keeping an eye for where sources material are coming out out there, because as we know, anytime events unfold before our eyes, we are full of misinformation and every piece of information we need to look at has to be checked, has to be taken with a grain of salt and not be just responded to and build opinions harshly, right? Um, coming out of that. Look at the history and then look at the present and look at both from multiple perspectives. All right, with that, we'll see you all next time. Bye.